Good afternoon. Thank you for joining today's webinar, Penetration Testing Exploitation Frameworks. My name is Kimberly Dillon. I'm a Marketing Manager here at Netcom Learning, and I'll be moderating the session for us today. Andre Krehel is our presenter, and before we get started, I'll just tell you a little bit about him. He's one of our IT security instructors here at Netcom Learning, and he's got a very impressive resume as the founder and CEO of an international cybersecurity and digital forensics firm. He's also got experience in identity theft recovery, data breach management, and over 20 years of security and forensics experience. So we're really glad to have him here today, and I can't wait for us to get started. But before we do that, let's just take a quick look at today's agenda and do some housekeeping. Um, I'll go over the GoToWebinar controls with you really quickly, and then we'll get into our presentation with some live demonstrations and then we'll have a Q&A and I'll go over some of the courses at the end of the session. Um, just as a reminder, this webinar is being recorded and we'll have a recording of it posted on our website um, probably by tomorrow. One thing about the GoToWebinar controls is that all participants are muted, so if you do have any questions throughout the session, which we encourage you to have to make it a more interactive um, experience for you, please type them into the question pane and then Andre or myself will respond. And with that, we'll go ahead and get started. Andre, I'm going to send you, or I'll make you the um, presenter now, so we can get going. Great. Thank you, Kimberly. OK, perfect. Can uh, you see my screen? Yes. Oh, ready phenomenal. To go. Thank you for having me today. And thank you very much, everyone, for uh, participation in our webinar. What we would like to cover today are penetration testing exploitation frameworks. So what we will focus on is, is overall market of penetration testers and what it really means being a penetration tester uh, at these days and what kind of frameworks are basically available for testers to exploit found vulnerabilities. And we look at the definitions, we look at various frameworks and overall landscape of a cybersecurity at, um, as we see it today. I often do get a question, what do I do for a living? And then I start explaining to people, like cybersecurity specialists and information security, uh, digital forensics, penetration testing, and then I said, forget it. I'm just a digital firefighter. Anytime there is a fire, there is a problem in a cybersecurity, then we go and try to make an assessment of that fire. How big is it? What really happened? How it happened? And what are the steps for remediation? And one of the steps in a remediation in a post-breach scenario is actually vulnerability assessment and penetration testing on the technical side of the house, of the component when the various elements of enterprise network have to be tested. So of course, that comes as overall information security strategy for the enterprise, but the technical elements are generally tested with the technical tools. So what we will focus today are actually tools that do um, make an assessment and actually do the exploitation of the vulnerabilities that have been found. Very interesting site is datalossdb.org. And what you can find here are actually is a snapshot of data breaches that have been covered by the media and are publicly available. So from all these publicly relevant sources, the data breach statistic is collected and then you can see what is it really the major footprint in all those breaches. So as we see here, the most of them are actually hacked and a web. So that's a very prevalent category. So web-based type of data breaches and hacking into the computers. The second largest category is a stolen laptop or if you combine it with the lost media and stolen document. So you have these two prevalent attack vectors or enterprises at these days. So the, the second part, of course, can be addressed by corporate governance policies and procedures, encryption, and keeping data more secure. The component of hacking and a web needs to be addressed a different way. And that's where the penetration testing and vulnerability assessment actually comes in. When it comes to the exploitation itself, the most of the attacks that we see today actually come from web-based type of attacks. 
So what we investigate and remediate are primarily PCI DSS breaches, which means payment card industry data security standard type of environments that claim to be in compliance with processing the consumer data, but often are found not. And what that compliance actually does for them is just a snapshot at a time. So when they submit their quarterly penetration testing results and vulnerability assessment results, they often overlook various configuration and operative, operative issues that are at those um, enterprises. It is generally mid-sized business that's being targeted by hackers. And the hackers extract the credit card data from those environments. And if you look at the web-based type of attacks, we could divide them in three prevalent categories. Something that targets the user itself, something that targets the web application, and the attacks that do target the browser. The combination of all three, it seems to be the choice of the hackers. So they somehow try to leverage the user and the web application or user and web browser, which means that the user is also part of the attack. So they try to social engineer in a certain way user to do things that normally he would not do. So for example, click on a link, click on a Word document, Excel spreadsheet, PowerPoint presentation or something else. And there are various exploits. The most common, uh, the, uh, the newest exploit actually injects a DLL into the Internet Explorer and takes over the user computer. So it's a combination of user doing something and exploiting the vulnerability in the browser and underlying operating system. Okay. We often get a question what the cost for such cybercrime actually is. And the first published study came from Panama Institute and now it's being second annual cost uh, published in 2011. And we can see that these type of attacks do have a heavy cost and it's around $140,000. And this is just the cost for the remediation for a technical component of that breach. So basically you're dealing primarily with partially addressing the compliance and also remediating the incident at the time it happened. And it seems that the malicious code and insider are the most costly. So whenever you, you are actually suffering an attack where they not only penetrate your network, but they also are able to put the malicious code on your network that collects certain type of data and information that comes up as a higher cost for that enterprise. And of course, enterprises that suffer the breach are better in addressing their second breach if they have ability to do so because some of them do go out of the business. So what do we mean by a system penetration? And there are various definitions of system penetration. Now, for purposes what I'll be describing in this presentation, it will be the act of successfully breaching security on the remote computer system, so on some technology-based system, in order to gain some sort of control on access. Well, what do we mean by some sort of control access? So we either get, for example, the attacker either gets the access to the computer system or he gets hold of the data. The main purpose of attacker might not be to own the system, but for example, extract the PCI DSS information, extract what's in the database of that system. And he doesn't have to breach completely the security of underlying operating system. What he is trying to breach is actually controls about around how data are governed on that system. So how access control measures are provided for store data set on the system. Of course, we need to look at the security architecture, uh, attacker's profile, the scope of that penetration, and also what are the time constraints in the penetration testing itself. And how would that correlate actually to uh, standard enterprise security functions. We should not be mistaking 
a penetration test for a full security audit. This is only a technical component of your cybersecurity program. It's one of the many technical system type of checks that you need to do in your enterprise. It is one, perhaps, most commonly mentioned for outside and internal network, but it's only one piece in your overall, overall security strategy. The attacks try to exploit a certain type of the vulnerability. So what does it really mean? What, what is the meaning of word vulnerability? And when we look at the various definitions, the one that probably sticks the most is that the vulnerability in the computer security language refers to a weakness in a system that it's allowing an attacker to violate what we know as a triage of cybersecurity, which is confidentiality, integrity, and availability. But in addition, it also allows him somehow to bypass the access control and consistency or audit mechanisms on that system. So then the um, data and applications on that system are being actually compromised. So vulnerability basically cre creates a weakness in the environment that attacker can exploit. And the exploitation and exploit is actually security attack on that vulnerability. So attacker finds a vulnerability and then he's trying to exploit it. So does, does it really mean that he has access to a secure system? Well, actually not. It does not mean he has access to a secure system. So knowing the vulnerability will not grant him the access. So what is the next step that he has to do, an attacker, to actually gain the access to that system? So for example, the attacker can exploit an intrusion detection system and reboot or crash it um, before he launches the footer attack, but that doesn't mean that he really obtain any information from that intrusion detection system. So in order successfully exploit the vulnerability. We often read in articles and technical papers that some type of malware is being ran, attacker can run a code of his choice, and it's a buffer overflow, and it has a remote execution of a code. So there is something else that comes with exploit. And that component that actually ran in a memory, generally in a memory of a computer, and help attacker to gain access to the system, we call it a payload. And a payload is a really necessary helper in exploitation. Generally, the payload is a sequence of the code when it's executed, when that vulnerability is triggered on that system. So it's a basically attacker is exploiting the vulnerability, and then he's trying to run the payload on that system, which generally can have two consequences. If you imagine having an application on that system, then the application either crashes or process the payload. And of course the application might reboot after the, the service crashed. For example, any type of web-based service would reboot after it's being crashed. However, it may also just die and it has to be rebooted. Depends on what the buffer, how the buffer, for example, overflow is rewritten in the memory of the computer. So in a simplistic language, the exploit is really, in very general terms, compound of two pieces. It's a vulnerability plus payload. So let's take a look at the payload. Seems that it's very interesting piece in the exploitation. And it's usually right in assembly language. So it is usually written in language that directly can be stick into a memory of that system that's being exploited. So it is it is written in a language that will be very quickly interpreted by the system that we are trying to exploit. 
Now, what it really means is that it's going to be platform and operating system dependent because every system, even Windows-based systems, are handling memory allocation for its applications different way. And it also means across the platform, for example, if you have Windows XP with various service packs, there are going to be differences how the memory allocation actually works. So the, so the payload is platform and OS dependent. That also means that if you create a payload that works on Unix platform, that will most likely and generally not work on Windows platform, even if you are exploiting the same bug, for example, in the same application. We also need to know something about the architecture, how data are being actually stored and pulled from the memory of the computer. And we often call them in the order of the small Indian or big Indian, and that depends on the type of architecture. If it's an Intel, for example, a Spark, or a different type of architecture, because they have tendency to store data and pull them from the memory in a different way. Payload can be also further divided into various categories. Depends on the task and functions that is actually performing. So the exec payload would execute a command or some program on the remote system. And that's what we will do today. We'll do the demo of the exec payload. Then we have a payload that can actually download something, a file from a URL or executor. So for example, download payload can be a TFTP session that's been spawned from that system and it's downloading something to that computer. Or it could be an exploit that's directly downloading something into the memory after exploitation and into allocated space in the memory of that system. <laughs> Upload will, be, will basically uh, get the file and execute on a local system. And there could be payloads that do manipulate a settings. So, for example, payload that adds user into a system account. So, after the exploitation, the payload would basically add another user, for example, into the administrative privilege account on the system. The very payloads do exist in these various frameworks. And you need to learn what they really do and how they operate. You probably do not need to know, unless you're very good in programming, how to program these payloads. Because most of the payloads are being actually created for you in various penetration testing frameworks. However, you do need to understand, for example, knobs, non-operation pointers, and various pointers, how the vulnerability actually is being exploited. Because the main advantage of the frameworks is the flexibility, that you have ability to go, and some of them, for example, in open source, and modify that specific set that you are actually executing and running against the vulnerable system. So let's look at, at some of the uh, penetration testing frameworks. <laughs> and probably when you say war penetration testing frameworks, and if you Google that word, you will find actually a UK site that describes a workflow a workflow of penetration testing. And it could be one. So the, so the framework could be really something as OSSTMM, which is the Manual Open Source Security Testing Methodology, and provides you a guidance on how to test the system. And then of course, list some tools that you can use for that framework and how you obtain information and what it really means, for example, banner grabbing. What does it really mean to scan the system and how you need to scan the system? Okay, do you use a SYN scan? Do you use a Connect scan? Do you use a Christmas tree scan? It, it, give you, it gives you a workflow through the whole penetration testing scenario. So how would you test external network? How would you test internal network? Uh, how would you test web application if you knew the credentials? Most likely, the framework is being mentioned various times and is a part of various open source Unix distribution uh, is Metasploit. And we will do the demo of Metasploit today uh, with one of the commands. 
the Metasploit provides very effective background to learn what it really means an exploitation in a system and how to organize the exploits. And it's divided into various categories, not only OS platform based, but also how it's organized. For example, the payload is being divided for reverse shell, normal shell, Windows based shell, 32 bit Windows shell, um, shell for Windows 7, XP, and all those are actually available to you. So when you are trying to add your own exploit into it, the framework provides a space for you to tap to those resources. And what you need to specify, if you recall when we had the um, exploitation equal vulnerability plus payload, the payload is most likely created for you already in there. So you have all these various payloads available. What you need to find is a vulnerability. And as long as you very well define and coded vulnerability, you can tap into the resources of the framework, such as Metasploit. Very interesting projects are now coming into the web penetration testing frameworks. And some of them I have actually in here. If you look at the site called OWASP, one of the projects they have is, is Xenotix. And now we are at the version 5, which is a cross-site scripting exploit framework. It's an interesting momentum where we shifting from buffer overflow type of vulnerabilities that are heavily embedded in Metasploit. And now Metasploit also comes with web component, web testing component, just strictly for frameworks that are directly towards web services. Another very targeted framework that, that's also posted in OWASP is SQL Ninja. And used to be just a tool called by the hackers. Now it's more of a framework for exploitation of SQL injection. And it gives the ability to look at various databases. So SQL injection, the same way as we had the exploitation equals vulnerability plus payload, is heavily dependent on underlying database of that system. So for example, MS SQL and MySQL and Oracle are going to have different syntax for HTTP GET request, perhaps for the same vulnerability exploitation. Interesting framework that's coming on end user side and exploitation of end users is actually Beef. It's a browser exploitation framework. And what that actually does, if the user is on a certain site, it creates what they call the hook and it basically exploits the browser of the user and takes over the system of that end user. The paid packages that you can basically buy, there is a Metasploit Pro version, there is a Canvas version that you can purchase, Core Impact, and these are the frameworks that you can buy and leverage. What I see as a benefit is if they come with a vulnerability scanner. And for example, the Metasploit come with Nexpose. And then when you scan your system, it will provide you direct path for the exploitation of that system. So it basically it will pass the vulnerability um, for that system. Okay, let me see. I think we have the question here. What programming language are pillows generally written in? and the most person is writing pillows themselves depending on exploit. So as I answered, the, most of the pillows are actually written in assembly language. And generally at these days, I wouldn't say the pen tests are actually writing their own payloads to exploit the system. The payloads are heavily leveraged from frameworks such as Metasploits. The Metasploit provides you if you do a show command on Metasploit itself, it will provide you actually the list of the payloads. It's quite impressive. And it it combines the classical shell, reverse shell, and various other components. Interesting framework is also social engineering toolkit. And if you look at the framework itself, it really classifies what type of attacks 
would you have and can you can attacker perform in a social engineering? What seems to be a prevalent choice for hackers um, at, at this era is combination of a social factor with some technical component. And it not only affects end users, but it also affects the security professionals. So they try to lure the security professionals to do certain things that they normally would not do. And also interesting project on the web penetration is NetSparker. You might want to go and after the session go and look at some of those. And you find it quite interesting. The big momentum and very good combination of a web vulnerability open source scanner and partially also exploitation is W3AF. And it's a really interesting piece when it comes to measuring a security posture of your web applications. None of the frameworks will provide you 100% of security or assurance. The exploitation frameworks are here to help you exploit the vulnerability, not to find, right? So they might have a mode, for example, like Metasploit, the hell, where you shoot all the packets, but it's, it's not about finding vulnerability. They more try to help you exploit vulnerability. Of course, there can be combination, like for example, W3AF that started as a web vulnerability scanner and now has the two parts, the part of the scanning and part of the exploitation. And that's what I generally like the most. I like when I have ability to find a vulnerability and also exploit the vulnerability because that's the biggest help when you try to perform the penetration testing. So let me now uh, play demo. of Metasploit. So let's see here. All right, so here we have a distribution of Kali, which is Linux-based distribution, has various folders with various tools as you can see it. Most likely we need to configure those tools. So what we look at here is exploitation and Metasploit itself and Metasploit framework. So when you run that command, it will come as a terminal, as an MSF, with a command line, and basically tells you what exploits you have available. And then you need to know how to navigate through it. So it's divided into exploit sections, and what I'm going to use is the exploit on Windows platform. When you already brute force credentials, how can you really reverse shell into it? There is a command also on sys internal called psexec. And psexec, this was a very good question in here, um, do you have to really write it all, or does it exist, all these tools somewhere else? And they do exist, for example, in a Metasploit. So you don't have to really reinvent the wheel. You can just set the parameters. For example, I'm setting here remote host and um, payload and local host. And you use the tool PSExec, which will give you, as you will see at the end, complete shell of the system. So, for example, here I'm setting the payload, Windows Shell Reverse DCP. If you do show the payload, if you do various options, you can actually see. It's not as user-friendly as you would think. However, it, it has very good description and manual that, that comes with the uh, Metasploit community version. So here I set my local host. Now I need to set the port because it's a reverse shell. So I have to set my local port. And I need to specify something that's not being used by local system. And I've done my homework, so I already look at the netstat, and I know that the port 8888 on my system is not firewalled, and it's also available. Now I'm setting the user, and I said, as I said, I already know the credentials of the user. I know, already know the local admin on a box, just to make it simple. Now I set the password for that individual. And if some of you took already Certified Ethical Hacking program, this is the favorite password to use for admin. And now let's see what we can exploit. It has very nice debug mode. So now it runs. It, as you see, it's created some executable on the system. It connected us back into the system. 
and now we are right on the system. This is actually a command prompt from the machine we just connected into it via River Shell. And now I'm listing directory. Why did I get into the Windows System 32? Because that's where the cmd.exe is. And now I walk out of the directory, listing the C partition. Right, so I see that I have a Metasploit on it, um, program files, and Windows. This is probably x64 based system just by looking at the folders. Now I can run the commands of my choice on a system. Right, and let's look at the address that I have on the system. Right, so this is my IP address on the system. And basically now I have full access back and forth to the system. So I can use command line as an administrator, do whatever the way I want it. Right. The PSXS was one of the tools that was used by hackers when they penetrated the network. So basically they used the tool to maneuver. So when they exploit the credentials, local ad administrative credentials, then they went around in these various environments that we actually have seen. All right, so what are the challenges in penetration testing and using these frameworks? Well, we need to have really well experienced and well technically knowledgeable resources for the exploitation. Um, it really comes with the technical training and heavy technical training to understand what type of exploitation can be performed on the system. Generally, the, the challenge is that there is no formal framework or processes, uh, tools, to help the estimate time and effort. So often when you are engaging in penetration testing, it, it is really hard to predict how quickly can, for example, you find that vulnerability or how successful are you going to be and what time frame you are able to penetrate that system. Because you are looking at a large scale of vulnerabilities, but hackers they perhaps look for something very specific, opportunistic, or they just strictly know, for example, that a content management system such as Joomla, Mambo, or Drupal has this vulnerability and it's almost a zero day or a combination of a zero day and something else and they search for a string on internet and exploit all those systems. And you might not have that type of framework of knowledge they do have at the time of exploitation. The next piece is that, as I mentioned, the frameworks are very good in taking someone else's code and embed it into it. The only caveat here is that the exploits that are in general domain, in a public domain, are often unreliable and require quite a bit of customization. So you will have to rewrite it and test them. So they're often just kind of dirty, quick hacks uh, in a Perl script. They are proof of a concept, so they only work with a certain conditions and you have to do further research to actually make an improvement. So you can really heavily rely on public available exploits. There are a few companies that do collect them and provide them and they do have already well clean exploits, but that's only for certain scenarios. And for example, when, you, when it comes to web exploitation, you often have to craft your own query, your own exploitation query. Okay. When it comes to vulnerability, it doesn't mean that if you know that vulnerability, um, that it's very simplistically and easily can be exploited. Just because that vulnerability exists doesn't mean that it cannot, for example, on internal network, cannot be protected by something else. And if you look at, for example, the PCI DSS component, they do have a section called Compensating and Controls. An example would be a system that's sitting in a segmented network where patches or security fixes are no longer provided the system is running web application firewall or some sort of firewall packet filter or some, some, whole, some sort of restricted access to it. So then the attacker would have a limited choice basically to attack that system. So even if you know the vulnerability exists on the system, it still could be a challenge 
to exploit that system. We often get a heavy result from these various vulnerability assessments that we try to leverage for penetration. And optimizing and organizing information and make something useful in them becoming a challenge. Because just because you have all information and it's almost as a quick and dirty look at that technical system doesn't mean that you can draw certain high-level conclusions and recommendations about that system. It is not trivial to answer just from few scans that you ran again to the system, even though you see that there is something that looks suspicious and potentially could be vulnerability, it is very hard to make a prediction on what what that system actually uh, is. Now, when it comes to combining all information from these various tools and gaining intelligence, we often found that there is no really good framework for consolidating reports and for consolidating information in those various tools. So you have to do quite a bit of work on, on your own to actually digest that information and consolidate information that you obtain and um, put them into a really human readable report. And often you will have to create two types of reports. And that's a report for executives and a report for technical individuals who will remediate that vulnerability. I want to show you something that was circulating around maybe three or four years ago around the internet. And this is a VET request, get request, as a specified in RFC 2616. <clears throat> if, you can, if you can look in here, there is some type of obfuscation going on here. And there is a cast variable that's being encoded. And at that time, if you Google the story, SANS actually wrote a white paper on this type of attack. And it was one of the first SQL injection worms that was massively penetrating various websites that were vulnerable to this type of hack. The encoded variable in a cast was at that time only recognized by one web application firewall. All of them were basically blind. So imagine having some type of obfuscation in the traffic itself may create a vulnerability if the web server can process and your web application firewall is completely blindless. So let's look at the decoded CAS variable in here. And as, we, as you see in here, there is a select statement that's updating various tables and injecting a script with HTTP into one of the tables. And of course, we all know what A type U is probably user, and C type N of our char set variable actually here means. It's basically in a DBO, this columns table, so in a main object, basically adding that script as a part of the table. Quite interesting type of the exploitation. What I also want to show here that some of these attacks are not quickly recognized. For example, here I can see actually script being injected into it. But if, if I haven't seen it, would I, really, would I still recognize that this is SQL injection? So the statements that we generally do test in as a part of the certified ethical hacking program, like one equal one apostrophe, are very simplistic form of SQL injection. Here you actually see the SQL injection that's a little bit more sophisticated and complicated to see and understand. I also want to show you very quickly how would it look like when someone is actually exploited with the beef, the browser exploitation framework project. And if you look at in here, the HTTP 1.1200 really means that a session is successful and the user is actually being hooked by the browser exploitation framework. So that's being basically ran on a web server side. And then what happens when the user connects to a certain site, 
that the user actually being exploited. His browser is being exploited through a certain vulnerability. Could be iframe vulnerability. Could be vulnerability in the browser. And here we have what really happens at the hypertext transfer protocol layer and how that exploitation actually looks like. All right. So what certifications are available? One of the programs that being for a while and well established is Certified Ethical Hacker. And it's also divided now into two sections. It starts from beginning maybe to intermediate level as a Certified Ethical Hacker type of program. Has some few advanced scenarios in it. And then it is really moved to the next layer by the License Penetration Tester certification. There are also certifications available from various other vendors. So SANS, for example, has GX Certified Penetration Tester. There is a Penetration Testing Engineer certification. There is another certification called OSCP Certified, CEPT Certified, Certified Penetration Tester but by IACRB. So there are various institutions that do offer now these certifications. So how would you pick a vendor that you like or the program that is good for you. It also depends on what stage you are and what do you do as a penetration tester. Because some of them, some of the institutions do have very well recognized name and they've been in the industry for a while. Uh, some of them are just becoming a very well known and recognized by industry. So you need to also think through what the program really is, what the agenda is going to be, and how far do you really want to go? Is there a next level for you to move once you obtain a security certification? Why would you really certify? I would say when I've got my certification, there was a very large industry acceptance um, and ethical security professional community of the certifi certified ethical hacker certification and it really had some meaning at that time because not many individuals actually did have that certification. So um, having certification really opened a door for us to do more penetration testing engagements. One, often you have no time while you're working and performing consulting engagements or inside house penetration testing you only learn what you are working with and you don't get the knowledge from these various other systems or from various other methods and frameworks on exploitation. So when you take the certification course you will be also exposed to these various hands-on penetration testing methodologies and latest hacking practices. It also will build you with a new technical and project management skill set because you will have to lay out your framework, your own penetration testing frameworks, in meaning what tools are you going to use, how you're going to approach, what is the scope, how can you get from A to B. So it, it will present some management challenges for you as well. And of course, it's always good to have it on your resume and impress your colleagues. With that, um, I would say that the industry is getting quite a bit of momentum and penetration testing. And it's ultimately the knowledge and technical skill set and managerial qualities of penetration testers that distinguish them from various other folks that are entering the industry. So having certification program is something that you should consider. Thank you very much for your attention. and. Looking forward to seeing you again, perhaps this year. Great. Thank you so much, Andre. Um, before we end this session, I'm just going to go over and let you guys know some of the classes that are coming up at NETCOM.
All right, so we've got actually a CEH and CNDA class coming up um, starting March 24th, then again on April 7th and May 12th. We've also got the CISSP certification, if that's something that you're interested in. We have a class that's starting next week, if that's too short of notice, and we've got classes starting in April and May, and again throughout the year. Um, and we've also got the CompTIA CASP um, certification class starting in March, June, and August. We have more classes on our website, www.netcomlearning.com. And if you have any questions, you can email us at courses at netcomlearning.com, and we'll give you more information about that. Um, I see somebody had a question about the CEU credits. You'll get an automatic email after this webinar, and then you can use that to submit to CompTIA for your um, proof of this webinar. And if you have any other questions, again, give us a call or email us, and we'll help you out. Thank you so much for joining us, and thank you again, Andre, for a great presentation. Thank you for having me.